intermittent fasting can be a little bit different for you when you're over 40. Now, I'm not saying you're old by any stretch of imagination, okay? When you're over 40, just hormones are a little bit different. There's different enzymatic fluctuations that we have to account for. So all this means is that we make these small little changes to our intermittent fasting lifestyles and we can have just as much success as people that are younger than us. So here's the thing, you probably know someone that's in their 20s or 30s and is doing intermittent fasting, they're having all this success and they want you to do it alongside them. Well, you might not get the same results if you just follow their exact protocol. So the purpose of this video is to give you little things that you can apply to your intermittent fasting lifestyle that'll help you out if you're over the age of 40. This isn't a meal plan, I'm not gonna give you exactly what to eat, but what I am gonna give you is tips and tricks that are gonna make your fasting lifestyle a lot easier. I'm gonna talk about what you should be doing while you're fasting, how often you should fast, how long you should fast for. I'm gonna talk about specific foods that you can get some benefit out of during your actual eating period. I'm gonna talk about some supplements that you can take that'll help you out, and I'm just gonna give you some overall knowledge that's gonna make you a lot more powerful when you're embarking on an intermittent fasting lifestyle. You're tuned in to the internet's leading performance, nutrition, and fat loss channel. We got new videos on Tuesdays, Fridays, and Sundays at 7 a.m. Pacific time, but we also release videos just about every single day nowadays. I want you to go ahead and hit that little red subscribe button, but I also want you to go ahead and turn on that little bell button so that you turn on notifications. It'll make it so you always know whenever I post a new video like this. So without further ado, let's just go ahead and get into this, okay? This is gonna be some good stuff, and I want you to stick with me through the entirety. The first thing I wanna talk about is how often you should fast. Okay, so people that are younger, they can get away with fasting more frequently. Now what I mean by that is people that are in their 20s and 30s, they can usually do what is called a 16-8 fasting period. Okay, now that is great and it works well, and it does work well for people over 42, but hear me out. The 16-8 fasting period, basically that tells you that you fast for 16 hours and then you have an eight hour period of eating and you generally do that every single day. That just becomes your new pattern of eating. But as you get older, you actually get more benefit out of fasting for slightly longer periods of time, three to four times per week. So we're talking about maybe doing a 20 hour fast three times per week or maybe four times per week. Now, the reason behind this is a couple of things. For one, you're gonna get more of what's called a telomere response. The longer the fast, the more anti-aging potential you get. Someone in their 20s and 30s doesn't really need a whole lot of anti-aging effect. I mean, sure, they can benefit from it, but once you're over 40, you can get a powerful effect from the anti-aging side. Now by anti-aging, I mean cellular anti-aging. I don't just mean looking good and looking pretty. I mean actually increasing our telomere length, which is a component of our DNA that ultimately unravels as we get older. I'm gonna save you the details on that. But essentially, if we restore our telomere length and we have more stem cells through longer periods of fasting, we can essentially live longer and fight off disease for a longer period of time. But the big reason that a lot of you are probably watching this video is body composition. Now, as you get a little bit older, if you were to fast every single day and restrict your calories every single day, you have more of a potential to slow down your metabolism than someone that is younger does. So for example, someone that's 25 or 30, they could fast every single day and they could limit their calories every single day and not have as much of a metabolism slowdown because of the restricted calories as someone over 40 would. So it's better to have a normal level of calories one day and then an aggressively reduced level of calories the next. So basically, instead of gradually reducing your calories or staying low all the time, you're gonna do more of a regular calorie maintenance to keep your metabolism high, and then you're gonna drop your calories aggressively on a longer fast, like 20, 21 hours, and then go back up the next day. So I recommend fasting every other day if you're over 40. You just seem to get more benefit, and the clients that I've worked with, like, they just you can't deny the results. People get better results that way. Now, is there a lot of medical reason and research-backed reason? Kind of, but it's still up in the air. This is just what I've seen. Now, there was one study that took a look at 30 females that were at least 49 years of age, ranging all the way up to uh, 57 years of age. Now, what they found with this age group, 
is that they responded better to longer term fasts. Now we're talking like one to two days plus in this case, but the point was they had increased levels of adenopectin, they had lower LDL levels, and they just ended up having better health overall. So older populations, again, I'm not putting you in an older population category, I'm just saying that people that are over 40 tend to respond a little bit better from a health perspective to a longer fast. The other big thing that we have to look at, and this is good for men and women, is human growth hormone increases only really come into play with fasting when they're longer fasts. So sure, a 16 hour fast, if you're doing typical 16-8, might have some benefit when it comes to growth hormone surges, but a longer fast is really where you're gonna get the powerful effect. Human growth hormone is everything when you're a little bit older. Okay, when you're over 40, human growth hormone is what's gonna make your skin look fresh, it's gonna be what's allowing you to build muscle, what's gonna allow you to recover, it's going to allow you to feel young. This is very important and you need to have those longer fasts. So I would rather you end up having these longer fasts a few times per week than shorter fasts. You need to go for more of the metabolic benefit versus just the caloric restriction. Trust me, the results will be better long term. So let's go ahead and let's talk a little bit about what you should be consuming or not consuming during your fast. During your fasting period, things are simple, honestly. This goes for anyone that's 15 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, or 50, 60, whatever. Okay. While you're fasting, you should keep it simple. I always say, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. That's, that's the way you wanna do it. If you start overcomplicating it, you'll drive yourself crazy. So for all intents and purposes, water, black coffee, black tea, green tea, that's really it, okay? I mean, sure, you could get down to the idiosyncrasies of different diet sodas and stuff like that, but just keep it simple, honestly. It's just way easier. Now, that's gonna go for everybody, but some specific things that you might need to be paying attention to if you're over 40, you're going to want to increase your sodium level more so than someone else. Now, you might be thinking, Thomas, that sounds crazy. I'm gonna turn this video off right now. I'm older, why would I want to increase my blood pressure with more sodium? Well, first of all, Sodium does not always equate to higher levels of chronically high levels of blood pressure. Okay? It's more about insulin, more about sugar. There's a whole other rabbit hole we could go down there. Sodium plays a very big role in overall sending an electrical signal through our body. And when we're fasting, we need that to occur. We need that electrical signal. Otherwise, our electrolytes get out of whack and we don't get the benefit of fasting. And as you get older, the nervous system isn't quite what it used to be which means we're relying more on healthy minerals to get the job done. So unless you wanna feel fatigued and a little bit stiff during your fast, then you're gonna to wanna to have some sodium in the equation. So make sure you're getting a high quality sodium. We're talking like Himalayan pink salt, some Celtic sea salt, some Redmond real salt, one of those. Don't go for just regular iodized salt, okay? Go for the good stuff whenever you possibly can. And I will give you some numbers here. You usually wanna have like one teaspoon per half gallon of water. So we're not talking like a crazy amount, but we're talking enough to at least keep you hydrated, okay? Hydration is key. This next tip for when you're fasting is a very big one, very important for people that are over 40, and it has to do with catecholamines, which are our adrenaline, our epinephrine, things like that. All right, if you consume caffeine, like coffee or tea, consolidate it to the morning, okay? Normally, if you're younger, you're okay to have caffeine throughout the entirety of the day during your fast. And I'm not saying that you're gonna absolutely blow all the benefits if you do have caffeine through the entirety, but you will get better results and you'll feel better, and here's why. As you get older, you're more sensitive to your catecholamines. You're more sensitive to epinephrine, norepinephrine, and things like that. Now, that's a good thing in some ways because intermittent fasting is ultimately giving you an adrenaline rush. You're not eating, so your body goes into sort of a starvation, kind of uh, fight or flight mode. So your catecholamines are already high. Your adrenaline is already high. Well, caffeine spikes your adrenaline even higher. What you don't wanna have happen is have your adrenaline spiked so high for such a long period of time because you're consuming caffeine along with your entire fast that you end up burning out your adrenals. The adrenal fatigue is a real thing. Okay, adrenal fatigue isn't recognized by the medical community as an actual diagnosis, but there is something that's recognized by the medical community such as adrenal insufficiency, and that's very similar. It's just kind of different terms, right? The point is, is if you have too much caffeine throughout the entirety of the day while you're fasting, you can give yourself some adrenal fatigue. That can wreak havoc for you later on down the line and make it so you're chronically tired. If you consolidate your caffeine to the morning, you get a big rush of catecholamines when your body is supposed to have them. And also when you're most susceptible to burning fat. So if you're gonna have caffeine, 
allocate it to the morning and then go ahead and let yourself kind of wean off of it throughout the course of the day. You just have to have some faith in me on this one. Trust me, it makes a lot of sense when you look at the research. This next tip is one that goes for everybody and that is to work out in a fasted state. Now, if you're over 40, one of the things you might be concerned about is, am I gonna wear myself out? Like, I'm tired, I'm fasted, should I really be working out? The answer is, yeah, you really should be. You don't have to push it to the limit, but you're going to get a lot more benefit out of working out in a fasted state. Now, those of you that know my channel, you're saying, Thomas, you sound like a broken record, you talk about this all the time. Well, just respect the fact that there's a lot of people watching this video that haven't watched my other videos. Okay, when you work out in a fasted state, you recruit what are called intramyocellular lipids. These are fat droplets that are actually in your muscle cells, or not, not in your muscle cells, but next to your muscle fibers. Now, when you work out in a fasted state, you burn those up. So you actually burn two to three times as much in the way of intramyocellular lipids, sometimes even more, if you work out in a fasted state. The benefit to someone that's over 40 here is you can get by with working out at a lower intensity. Wow, did Thomas just say that? Working out at a lower intensity. Yeah, I mean, heck, if you can do the most with the least, go for it. You might as well preserve your body. It's not all about going balls to the wall every single day. So if you can get more out of your workout by training in a fasted state and not have to push your body to the limit where you're breaking down and can't even hang out with your kids or grandkids, yeah, I'd say that you shouldn't be doing that, right? You wanna be not, you wanna not push your body. You wanna be able to push it to an extent where you can still recover. So train in the morning in your fasted state. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about things that you shouldn't take during your fast. Okay, it comes up a lot. People talk about taking vitamins and supplements. I recommend just keeping them out of the equation. Okay, now there's always the exception, so bear with me, because no matter what the situation, there's always gonna be someone that has a particular supplement or a nootropic or something they wanna take while they're fasting, and I get it, and that's okay, but for the sake of this video, we have to keep it simple. Just keep supplements out of the equation, but especially keep antioxidants out of the equation, like vitamin C, and vitamin E and fish oil while you're fasting. Those are great supplements, but while you're fasting, they negate the effects of the fast. You have to remember that when we are fasting, we're trying to stress our body out. We're trying to elicit a stress response. Vitamin C is an antioxidant, which means it actually acts as a crutch for your body. Studies have shown, I don't recall the exact research journal, but studies have shown in multiple occasions that taking vitamin C and vitamin E during a fast actually hurts the metabolic effect of the fast. The fast should be difficult, so just bear with it. It's gonna to be tough, but you don't need to take vitamin C because you think it's gonna boost your immune system. It actually does the opposite. Let the fasting help your immune system naturally. Don't give it a crutch, okay? Okay, now let's move into breaking the fast, okay? Because really during the fast, things are simple, but breaking the fast gets a little bit more eh, particular. Now everyone should be breaking a fast in a similar way, and my philosophy behind breaking a fast is break your fast with a small-ish meal, Okay, small meal, and then have a larger meal one to two hours later, maybe even up to three hours later. Break your fast with something small, controlled, lean, and high in protein. The reason that I say this is because, for the most part, it's an emotional thing. You break your fast, and then you're not gonna be susceptible to just raiding the pantry. If you can control this one meal, control this one meal when you break a fast, it makes the rest of your eating period so much easier. You're not gonna run in the house and raid the pantry. I can't tell you how many times it's happened to me or people I know. At the end of a fast, I'm so hungry and I wasn't prepared and I walk in the house and I just end up just in a food coma in the pantry. It's just not good, right? So if you have something controlled and then you eat a little bit later, it's gonna work a lot better. Now, for the older populations at all, anyone 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, on and on up, you're gonna to wanna to have higher levels of protein. Okay. You might be thinking, this seems like it's harder on my kidneys, right? Now, the protein situation with the kidneys, that's a gray area, we don't need to go there. We have a bigger problem, and that's atrophy. Okay, atrophy is related to illness. Atrophy is the muscle breakdown, the catabolization, the breakdown of the muscle tissue. When we get sick, we have atrophy. Okay. Atrophy is linked with people just ultimately aging and dying. We wanna maintain our muscle, but we also wanna maintain our muscle because that's the biggest driving force behind our metabolism. As we get older, we do not preserve our muscle as much. We need more protein. It's more important as we get older. So what I recommend is when you break your fast, eat 25 to 35% of your body weight in grams of protein. Okay, now that sounds complicated, so let me like, give you an example. If there is a 200 pound person 25% of 200 pounds would be 50 pounds. So you should eat 50 grams of protein. So you basically take one quarter of your body weight 
in pounds and eat one gram of protein per pound. Okay, so a 200 pound person, 50 grams protein. Okay, that's gonna be straightforward. So when you break your fast, this is pretty much all you need to have, like lean protein. Okay, don't try to dress it up with a bunch of sauces and things like that. You can, you can season it. You could even add a couple veggies if you wanted to, but I highly recommend, honestly, just keeping it lean protein. I know it's bland, I know it's boring, but you can do it for one meal. Imagine this, you just broke your fast, or you just ended your fast, and you had your little bit of protein. And then an hour or two hours later, you can go to dinner, and you can actually enjoy a regular meal and not have to think anything of it, simply because you already ate your breaking the fast meal. Next up is you have to pay a lot more attention to prebiotic fibers. Make sure that you're getting in a lot of artichoke, a lot of asparagus, a lot of the veggies that have prebiotic fibers. Prebiotic fibers are the fertilizer of our gut bacteria. And when we go through a fasting period, a lot of our gut bacteria dies off. Okay, and what happens is the stronger, healthier bacteria tends to thrive. So what happens is at the end of the fast, we're usually left with a good amount of good bacteria. We wanna feed that. And regular veggies do some benefit there, but prebiotics are the big thing. So we have to get those prebiotics in. So what I recommend is with the second meal, try to get some artichokes in, try to get some asparagus in, try to get some bok choy in, try to get a little bit of cabbage. These things play a big role, and artichokes specifically promote what are called bile salts. So when you're fasting, a lot of times your gallbladder and your liver stop producing bile for a little bit, or they slow down on the production of it. So then when you eat something that's fatty, or even remotely fatty, you have a hard time digesting it. So what you wanna do is you wanna eat things like artichokes because they literally do promote bile activity. They promote bile salts, so they promote this that this basically bile salts are an emulsifier. So what they do is they promote that and that allows us to break it down, break down those fats and absorb them easier. Very important for you. You don't wanna end up being someone that doesn't digest fats very well because then A, you don't get the benefit of those fats, but B, you can have a lot of digestive discomfort. This next tip is a big one. On your fasting days, okay, whether you are low carb or not, you should really avoid grains. I know. I know it sucks, right? I'm telling you that I told you earlier that you can have so much flexibility and things like that, but just hear me out on this. You don't have to abide by this one. I'm just trying to give you what you could use to have optimal results. So grains have something called WGAs. These WGAs are called wheat germ agglutinins. Okay, we're just gonna call them WGAs, but these wheat germ agglutinins or WGAs, what they are are they're basically glycoproteins that stick together. So you've heard of people that have gluten intolerances or celiac disease, right? Where they, they really have an anti, like an actual autoimmune inflammatory issue where their body's own anti-inflammatory system or immune system is really having a hard time just breaking down gluten. Well, that's because essentially the gluten is triggering an immune response within that person. Well, believe it or not, grains like rice and corn and barley and rye, these things all have these WGAs in them, which means that when they get into our system, they clump together, and when they clump together, they end up causing an inflammatory reaction because they don't break down. So what happens is we end up with what's called a leaky gut, where these big clumps of food essentially are getting into our bloodstream and our immune system attacks them. Why is this so important on a fasting day? Because on a fasting day, you are sensitive to what you eat. So if you eat grains, that's fine. I just recommend on a fasting day, that when you do break your fast, you don't have those grains. Try to get rid of them. So try to avoid I mean, grains. We're talking rye, we're talking barley, we're talking rice, we're talking corn, we're talking quinoa. Even these so-called healthy grains, they can cause this issue for you. And this can be really, really unhealthy and really, really unpleasant. And you may not even realize it until you take them away and realize how good you feel. So some of the starches and the carbs you really could get away with more of are gonna be starches like uh, the potatoes. So we're talking like even red potatoes, white potatoes are gonna be fine. We're talking things like um, sweet potatoes. Okay, we've got plantains, we've got uh, beets, we've got parsnips. Okay, we've got a lot of these healthier starches that are coming that way, cassava. Okay, you can have a lot of these things and they're not gonna be bad, okay? Now there's a lot of gluten-free options out there that don't even use grains nowadays. So again, I understand that you might be going out to eat, you might be having some fun there, whatever. It's not like this has to be the gospel all the time. You, know, you can have grains, I'm just saying, in the ideal situation, try to just keep the grains out. It's easier on your body. Next up, switch your proteins out. Don't have the same protein every day when you break your fast, or even with your meals later on. Again, it comes down to a diverse bacteria in your gut. If you feed your gut one type of food over and over again, 
one type of bacteria is going to grow and other types of bacteria are going to come down. So we need to try to diversify so we're constantly feeding other kinds of bacteria. So just switch your proteins out. If you usually do whey protein, try a pea protein. If you usually do chicken, try to go for beef. You know, try to just switch it up as much as you possibly can. And then lastly, when it comes down to choosing your meat sources and everything like that, try to get some things in the way of saturated fat. Saturated fat is not going to be a bad thing for you. Let me give you a quick breakdown on what happened with saturated fat and why everyone thinks it's bad. I'm going to make this quick. People think the saturated fat clogs up in your arteries and that it's just big globs of fat that stick inside your arterial wall and give you a heart attack. Not the case at all. Okay? What happens is inflammation, which is a result more so of sugar and stress, causes an immune response which triggers an LDL receptor to become inflamed within our artery. Then what happens is our immune system sends white blood cells and the white blood cells go to the artery and they accumulate and then and only then does saturated fat start to cause an issue because then it causes a plaque and that plaque is what causes the actual problem or the myocardial infarction or the heart attack, right, or the stroke. So it's not about the saturated fat, it's about the inflammation. Well, one of the fastest ways to combat inflammation is through an intermittent fasting or ketogenic lifestyle. So honestly, get healthy, eat the healthy fats and you'll be good because the saturated fats are going to be really good for what's called your myelin. Yeah, your, your nerves have a sheath on the outside of them called the myelin sheath and this myelin sheath is critical for overall nerve signaling, okay, for, cell trans, or for signal transduction. So actually sending a signal from your brain down to your toes, whatever it needs to be, we need that. If the myelin is broken, the nerve signal cannot be completed. Okay, that proton, that gradient can't be created between the sodium and potassium, okay, that ion exchange. Complicated, we're not gonna go that route. There's also lots of little things that you could eat. Like for example, I highly recommend eating uh, seaweed, believe it or not. So we're talking about getting iodine from seaweed. The thyroid needs iodine to create T3, to create thyroid hormone. Okay, the thyroid is critical, and I mean critical for your metabolism. So don't ever just ignore it. Eat the seaweed or get some iodine somehow. Okay, a lot of times they put iodine in salt, but the hard part is salt that is iodized is usually low quality table salt. So by the way, if there's little snacks and things that you want that are safe during an intermittent fasting or ketogenic lifestyle, I want you to go ahead and check out Thrive Market. I went ahead and I put a link down in the description below. So in the description, after you watch this video, you'll see uh, a link for Thrive Market. And I've been able to create a specific keto and fasting bundle. Okay, so what that means is Thrive Market is something where you can go online and you can get your groceries shipped right to your doorstep. So you don't have to go to the grocery store and you can ultimately save a bunch of money because it's cheaper than the grocery store, plus you don't have to drive there. So I've worked with Thrive for a while, so I've created specific bundles. So if you click down in the link below, again, after this video, you'll get the Thomas DeLauer Keto or Fasting Bundles, which is my select foods for you if you're doing an intermittent fasting lifestyle. And these are snack foods, things that you can enjoy during your eating period. So after you're done fasting, you're kind of questioning what you can eat, what you can't eat, I highly recommend that you check them out. Plus, they're just cheaper in the grocery store. So if you like your groceries and you like them delivered right to your doorstep, you're gonna to wanna to check out Thrive. Okay, so let's go ahead and now let's talk a little bit more about supplements for a second. Okay, supplements keep to a minimum. Now, I could go on and on about all different kinds of supplements, but I think we wanna keep it basic. If you're a male, I want you to consume boron. Okay, you only need like six to nine milligrams of boron per day. Now, what boron is going to do is gonna help you unlock bound up testosterone to make it free testosterone. We have testosterone in our bodies, but most of it is bound up with what's called sex hormone binding globulin. Sex hormone binding globulin takes up 98 to 99% of our overall testosterone in the body and binds it to this, literally a globulin, meaning it's not usable in the body. Boron has been shown to unlock and release some of that sex hormone binding globulin. So if you're a male, you're going to get more muscle mass, you're going to get more overall energy, you're gonna get more strength, you're gonna get more libido, it's going to help you out immensely. So you definitely wanna get lots of boron as much as you can in a healthy way. You can also get it through specific foods also that are down in that Thrive link that's down below. So make sure you check them out. Additionally, for men and women, believe it or not, saw palmetto is very, very good. Now saw palmetto has long been thought only to be uh, something for prostate support for men, but it actually has some benefits for women too. So men, you're gonna wanna take a higher amount, Women, you can get by with less. But men, what saw palmetto is gonna do is it's gonna help 
slow down the conversion of testosterone into what's called dihydrotestosterone or DHT. Now what DHT does in your body is it enlarges your prostate, so it's a hyperplasia, so it's something we don't want. It's what makes you feel like you have to urinate all the time and it can even lead to some forms of prostate cancer. So this is just me looking out, actually, whether you're fasting keto or whatever, I do recommend that you take saw palmetto, so I'm just throwing that in there. All right, then we wanna look at coenzyme Q10. Coenzyme Q10 is everything when it comes to energy. I recommend it for a lot of people, but if you're over 40, it becomes very important. And it becomes extremely important when you are doing intermittent fasting. Not during your fast, but just overall in the lifestyle. You see, what's happening is you're consolidating eating windows, which means your body has to become ruthlessly efficient at utilizing nutrients. Now, what coenzyme Q10 does is it helps take energy, like electrons, from the food that we've eaten and takes it to electron acceptors within the cell. So basically, it is like the shuttle bus. It's like you drove to the baseball game, right? You got to the parking lot, but you had to park really far away. But fortunately, there's a shuttle that just takes you to the rest of the, to the game, so you can actually enjoy it, right? It's like you went the 99%, but you need that shuttle to get you in. Or it's like the escort. So CoQ10 is very powerful, and you don't always have to take a supplement with CoQ10, but let me finish explaining what else is happening with CoQ10. Inside our mitochondria, our mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It's where we create energy, okay? So without the mitochondria, we wouldn't ever be able to create adenosine triphosphate or actually create the spark that gives us energy. What CoQ10 does is it transfers energy from the outer membrane of the mitochondria to the inner membrane, and it creates what is called a proton gradient. Now, this is complex again, but that proton gradient is what allows energy to occur. It's all about creating a gradient so electrical energy can transfer and ultimately create energy and what's called the phosphorylation process where, anyway, complex. CoQ10 is good. You don't always have to take a supplement. If you take a supplement, 300, 600 milligrams is solid. Otherwise, eat lots of fatty fish. So we're talking about good, healthy salmon, halibut, things like that. Also, organ meats. I know that isn't always fun for people to think about, but liver, kidney, heart, if you're into that, it's really, really good stuff and it comes down to CoQ10. It's probably the most bioavailable form that you can get. So if you're into that, then you can make a sauce out of it or something, please go right ahead. Additionally, broccoli, cauliflower, and spinach are pretty high in CoQ10. Nowhere near as high as the animal sources, but if you're not into consuming all cuts of animal meat, then sure, you can just load up on the spinach or load up on the broccoli. You're gonna get an anti-estrogen effect from the broccoli too, which is very powerful for men over 40 and for women. Okay, so broccoli contains something known as DIM, methane. Talk about this a lot in my videos. Again, sound like a broken record for those of you that are used to my channel. But methane, derived from broccoli and cauliflower, helps the liver metabolize estrogen. It helps metabolize the 1,7-hydroxy uh, estrogens, the bad estrogens, and helps convert them into a healthy, usable form or a form that our body can emulsify along with bile and break down and excrete out of the body. So eat your broccoli. Okay, there's one last really important thing, okay? And this is something that some people will tell you you never need to do, and this is like the die-hard fasters that never wanna take a break, okay? This is called taking a diet break. And this isn't a cheat meal, okay? Because when you're intermittent fasting, in a lot of ways, you're kinda of cheating almost every day. It's like you're going a period of time without eating, and then you're kinda of binging. I mean, not, maybe not binging, a lot of times you're under control, but in some ways, you are eliciting that cheat meal response. So we're not looking for a cheat meal. We're looking for a diet break. And this is even more important when it comes down to uh, any older population. Heck, anyone over 35, to be completely honest. Now, there was a cool study that was called the MATADOR study. Now, the MATADOR study was an acronym. It stood for Minimizing Adaptive Thermogenesis and Reducing Obesity Rebound. Complicated acronym. Okay, what that means is when we diet, we have a pretty severe decrease in our metabolism. It happens, it doesn't take long either. It takes like three to five, sometimes six weeks for our metabolism to slow as much as 28% when we reduce our calories. Now when we're intermittent fasting, a lot of the benefits are coming from hormonal changes and different things that we're doing with growth hormone and stuff like that, but, but a lot of the benefit is still coming from just simple calorie restriction. We're not eating as much because we're consolidating our food to one period of time. So our calories are being restricted, which means that we are not immune to this overall metabolic slowdown. Now, this study, this Matador study, it took a look at what happens when you actually have people take a diet break for one to two weeks. So they took two groups of individuals. One group did 16 weeks of continuous dieting. Another group 
did 16 weeks of dieting, but it was broken up every few weeks with a one to two week diet break. Okay, so both groups ultimately still had the same diet for 16 weeks, just one group took breaks and one group did not. Well, the overall results were pretty amazing. The group that took the breaks ended up having significantly more muscle and significantly less body fat because their body had a chance to get the metabolism back up. Now, the whole purpose of our metabolism slowing down is to preserve. Our bodies see that we're hurting, we're not eating, so it slows down our metabolism. So one cheat meal doesn't solve the problem. You need to replicate what's really happening like in real life. And what's rep what would really happen in real life is you might go a week or two of back to normal eating. Not a surplus, but normal eating. So go four, five, six weeks with your intermittent fasting lifestyle aggressively. And then take a week of no fasting. Or maybe even two weeks of no fasting where you make sure you get back up to a normal maintenance level. That way, when you do, or if you do, ever go off of fasting or get your calories back up, you're not going to rebound. Okay? You're not going to have that obesity rebound that the Matador study was ultimately trying to you know, fix. It's adaptive thermogenesis. It's a totally normal thing. We just have to stay ahead of the curve. So this breaks down intermittent fasting over 40. I appreciate your time. And also, please, please, even if it's just a matter of checking them out, please check out Thrive down in the description because they didn't help make this video possible and they did allow me to create this awesome bundle for everybody. And at the very least, do it as a thank you to me for creating this video. Just go check them out. As always, if you have ideas for future videos, make sure you put them down in the comment section below. I'll see you soon.